Backyard Farmer is a co-production of NET Television and Nebraska Extension. Welcome back to another season of Backyard Farmer. We'll be here for the next six months to help keep your lawns green and weed free. So get your mower ready. All that moisture this winter could mean managing disease issues is going to be a priority this season. So send us a picture of your rots or spots and be sure to watch Backyard Farmer to keep those plants healthy. Probably not a lot of insect questions yet, but when it starts to warm up, our six-legged friends will soon be buzzing around looking for something good to eat. Remember to be kind to our pollinators, but if you start having insect pest problems, Backyard Farmer is only a call or click away. For over 65 years, Backyard Farmer has been your source for the best gardening advice. We're here to help you grow things the right way. Whether it's bats, squirrels, rabbits, or snakes, we're there to help the problem critters out and let the good ones in. Are you ready for another gardening season? If you've got questions, we've got answers. Welcome to Backyard Farmer. Welcome back to another season of Good Gardening on Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd, and we are really looking forward to answering all those questions this year. If you'd like to submit a question to us, just dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. The toll-free number is 800-676-5446. Our phone volunteers are always standing by to take those calls, and we do love your pictures and emails. That address is byf at unl.edu. Please give us as much information as you can, including where you live. And if you send pictures, please attach them as JPEGs. We'll answer those emails usually on a future show because we can't get to everybody's question on the air. Remember, you can follow us and get more information on our social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, all that good social stuff. And as always, we like to start with samples and Jonathan, dead things. Dead things, as usual, in okay. my patented little white box here. <laughs> Uh, so I brought a couple of types of our overwintering pests. We have lots of issues where insects like to get into the home. They use your house kind of as a little Floridian kind of getaway because it's kind of a heated log for them. You can see multicolored Asian lady beetle or western conifer seed bug, or you can see ones like I brought here today, the brown marmorated stink bug, and then the box elder bug, the red and black one on the other side. So when they get inside, they don't feed or mate. They're just waiting out the winter. And lots of people are seeing them get active right now as the warm weather kind of settles in because they're going to try and get back outside from your attic, your soffit, your crawl space so they can feed and mate and start everything over again. If you see them, sweep them up. If you see a big group of them, spray it with soapy water and then clean it up and destroy it. If you leave it around, it can get carpet beetles and things like that and cause more issues. Don't use things like bug bombs, though. It doesn't get where the pests are. And so it's just not a really effective control strategy. Soapy water and sanitation with a broom or with a vacuum cleaner. Those would be your best allies. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, Bill. That's I'm not turf. I brought, <laughs> I brought a box of dirt. No, this is, this is not dirt. This is soil. Uh, you, know, you, you can actually come to university and study soil science like I did. And today I wanted to talk about uh, compaction. So this is some soil that's near a sidewalk in Lincoln, and it is just a solid brick of soil. And so soil is kind of like a sponge. Uh, there's lots of little uh, air spaces in there and water spaces, and when the spaces get really small, they hold onto their water, and uh, the roots have nowhere to, to live, and there's low oxygen, and we have problems. So this is some soil that's not being abused by compaction, and we can see how it's got all this structure where the, the soil is, is kind of in these things called peds, and there's, there's little spaces for water to be held, and there's big spaces for water to drain. That's why a lot of our, even our high clay soils in Nebraska are generally classified as, is, uh, is good drainage because the, the water can get down in there. And Mother Nature does a great job of um, helping us to alleviate the compaction during the winter, during freezing and thawing. So the reason I'm talking about this now is I don't want people going out there and trafficking their lawns with unnecessary mowing because we've just aerated the soil with freezing and thawing and the wetting and the drying cycles of the winter. So let's protect that and, and try to you know, let those roots kind of grow into that nice loose soil so that we can set ourselves up to have a healthy lawn all summer. Excellent, besides which if you start mowing now, you get to mow a lot. Yeah, I'm trying to like avoid <laughs> unnecessary mowing. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, if you have a bunch of leaves, yeah, mulch mowing those in is one thing, but just to go out to mow, it's, it's not really gonna do a heck of a lot. All right, so. thanks Bill. All right, Kyle, you have an oddity. I do. Um, so this, I actually brought in some uh, a, a sedum, so a stone crop, 
And this sedum has fasciation. And so fasciation is really just kind of a, it's a mistake that plants make as they're growing. And, and so here on the, um, we have this one side that's much more, uh, the, the stem is a lot flatter and it's kind of almost ribboned out. And then the leaves up on top, you can see how there's just this mass proliferation of leaves over here. Meanwhile, this is what the sedum is supposed to look like, where the stems are not near as thick, single, singular leaves coming out, really just not that, not that proliferation that we're seeing on that other half. And uh, fasciation, it can be caused by, by a whole bunch of things. There are pathogens that can cause it. So there are fungi, bacteria, uh, viruses, phytoplasmas, but also a lot of non-pathological things, such as um, herbicides can cause fasciation, also extreme weather events, hmm. which there may have been a few extreme weather events in Nebraska recently, but those uh, um, having extreme uh, variances in temperature can, uh, can cause fasciation as well. And generally, the, the plant grows, um, the growing tip kind of grows in a circle, cylindrical, but when fasciation happens, it gets, gets confused and just starts to grow flat. So can be a can be something to you want to rogue out, but otherwise it can just be fascinating fasciation. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah, what did you bring for your sample? Well, I've got a couple of plants that are already getting started out in our landscapes right now. Um, this first one is henbit, and then I also have a little sample of field speedwell. So these are both very, very early season weeds, as you can tell. Uh, both of them are winter annuals. And um, so that means that the seeds germinate in the fall, they grow into a tiny little plant, and then they start to grow really early in the spring, even under very cold temperatures. Um, a henbit has square stems. So if you wanted to tell the difference between the two, you could roll the stems of henbit between your fingers and you would feel the flat edges. Whereas um, field speedwell just has little round stems. Um, henbit has kind of a pinkish purple flower, whereas field speedwell has little blue flowers, truly blue. So. These are weeds in landscapes, very, very common. Um, if you're seeing them now, this would be a good time to go out with your hoe. I mean, we have these warm days and people are anxious to get outside, so take your hoe out and go do a little hoeing and, and hoe these out. This is a great time because they haven't really started blooming yet. They're probably only a few days away from blooming, but they haven't started yet. Uh, and you can get them out of your garden before they set seed and create more plants for next year. But on the flip side, um, plants like this, especially henbit, that blooms in the spring is a great plant for the early pollinators. Mm -hmm. So the, the bumblebees that come out, the, the mason bees, it's a good food source. So, you know, if you can tolerate a little bit in your landscape, it will be beneficial to the pollinators. Excellent, okay. thanks. Yeah. All right, picture questions. I'm ready. I'm ready. So this is, an, <laughs> this is an Auburn viewer, Jonathan. Um, said these were, these gall things were all over a 60 year old oak last year. And they're seeing the old ones as they're cleaning up some of those oak leaves yeah. while they're raking, wondering, okay, is this, a, is problem this a problem or what? Yeah. So the good news is that it's not a problem. Oaks, they have the greatest biodiversity of galls that we see in any of our trees. So they get lots of different kinds. We've seen some that are called apple galls. We see some bullet galls, horned oak galls, lots of different kinds. This one, unsurprisingly, is called the oak leaf gall because of where it's located and what it grows on. Galls are just a tumor that the plant forms around an insect or a mite that tricks the plant into doing this with its saliva or secretions that come out during egg laying. And it tricks the plant into basically giving it a free house and some free food. It doesn't cause any real damage to the plant. It's just kind of an oddity. And so you don't really need to worry about any kind of control for this. Just rake it up, dispose of it. That could cut down the population, but no spraying or anything is necessary. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Yep. Okay, Bill, this yep. is a question from Fremont County, Iowa. Okay. And she actually had two different shrub sh shrubs showing this. Um, one was a uh, calicanth, or, I'm sorry, this is not you. This is pathology. That's my like, I don't have a shrub question. That's my goo. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I have my piles really in the wrong I'm really going to struggle spot. on that answer. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. It's the first show. Let's start over. All right, this is a Denton viewer and had a lot of vole damage in their lawn. Don't really want to know how to control the voles, but do want to know how to fix it. Yeah, so this is something that we'll see a lot this year with the snow cover that we had. The voles were 
kind of tunneling uh, under the snow and, and feeding and running around. And uh, for, it depends on the degree of the damage. In these situations, if uh, you know the ground is kind of bumpy, you can try to smooth it out as best as you can. But if you have, uh, it's going to depend really on what kind of grass you have. If it's a bunch type grass, like tall fescue, and there's actually some damage there, you might want to put some seed. If it's just a bluegrass lawn that can kind of fill itself in naturally, uh, the runs, the runways should be able to, to recover. It's just that the grass isn't growing, so you see it a lot worse right now. So let's just be a little patient and, um, you know, that grass should recover. If it is bad, it is the time to seed in the spring. You want to get that seed in the ground as soon as possible. So if you have, like, dog damage, like I do, you come in, you seed right now. Okay. Kyle, let's give you a turf question since I tried to give Bill... <laughs> Look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> now we're in Fremont County, Iowa, and, and this uh, viewer had... Uh, we, Euonymus or burning bush and calicanthus and both of them are showing this whitish coating all the way around the base and it's not it's not critter damage because I blew it up to look and see if it was critter. Okay. So. Um, yeah to me that actually looks like uh, lichens that are growing just up from the from the base. It happens quite a bit on especially when you have some of those woody those woody stems and lichens are, they're, um, it's a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae. And as far as control, I don't think there's really any, any control that would need to be done, um, if, assuming that, that it is a lichen. Now, if you've been seeing this bush and you've been no noticing its decline over a couple of years, well, maybe you have a root rot. Um, or malaria can cause that white growth. And so if you have been noticing a decline in that bush over a couple of years, there may be a chance that um, you do have root rot and you need to replace it. Otherwise, if the bush is otherwise looking fine, you just have that, that kind of white growth along the, um, along the base, I would just let it be and, and just enjoy the lichens. Excellent. And that is a, a loyal viewer. So if she has problems, we'll hope she'll send us a follow-up. Yes, indeed. I would have said the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sarah, we'll let them argue it out. <laughs> Your first picture is a pussy willow, and wascally wabbits have been chewing. And so this, uh, this viewer in Lincoln is wondering whether the plant will survive or what should happen here. And obviously there's more issues than just rabbits in that one. You bet. Um, yeah, tremendous amount of, of wildlife damage on shrubs this winter. You know, with all the snow we had, they had to feed on something. And so a lot of them uh, went to bark stripping on, on shrubs uh, for, as a food source. So this happens to be the same thing on Euonymus, basically. Um, so if, if the stem is really badly damaged, you know, this, this stem only has just a, a small piece of bark on the backside, which is actually still viable. So what I would expect this, this spring is that this branch would probably start to decline and die. It may leaf out in the spring uh, because there are some viable buds at the tips. So it may put some energy into, into leafing out, but then I would expect as the summer drags on that, that this branch would probably die. Mm -hmm. So as this viewer is looking at the branches in their landscapes, I would try to assess how much bark damage there really is. And if it's more than, say, 50% of the circumference of the branch has been damaged or stripped, then you're probably going to lose that branch. And so I probably would go ahead and cut it back. Um, otherwise, if, there, if it's just a small amount of damage, then I would give it a chance. I'd go ahead and, and let it um, remain and see how it does through the summer. Good. Thanks, Sarah. Well, spring has been struggling to come in Nebraska, and we also have some neighbors that are really in dire straits due to the massive snowstorm and the flood. We will be here on Backyard Farmer every step of the way to help those lawns and gardens recover, as well as give you much good news and as good gardening as we can. It's a rare person who doesn't really look forward to the coming of spring, and that is particularly true this year when we had a winter to remember, too much snow in some locations, that icy grip, not enough snow in other locations. And then of course this spring, or with the coming of spring, we got that terrible double whammy from Mother Nature. Horrible blizzard conditions in the panhandle and the loss of livestock, terrible floods in the eastern part of the state and all the way down the rivers and many of our creeks. And of course that will take months, if not years, to dissipate and to allow us to get back to life as normal. One of the great things about Backyard Farmer we will give you those resources to the best of our ability. We will connect you with them. And we will certainly do what we always do, which is answer your great questions. 
send them to us any way that you possibly want to email facebook all those good resources and of course then you can call into the show and a reminder it is your backyard but it's our backyard nebraska is our state as much as it is yours so what happens to us happens to you and vice versa and we will give you the information you need to grow good vegetables to make sure that your soils have recovered to tell you what you can do to mitigate the damage that has really impacted your lives to help you with rots and spots certainly those insect pests that may appear perhaps your turf is what really took a beating and you must have that turf in your landscape for it to be able to function well and of course the trees and shrubs so be assured the backyard farmer will bring you that great science-based education and information from nebraska extension and we will do that to the greatest extent possible during the entire year flood recovery of course is going to be a major topic this season so do stay tuned to backyard farmer each week and we really will do our best to help your landscapes and gardens get back on track all right Picture two. Let's do it. So this is evergreens have a lot of these bagworm things. Oh yes. Doesn't know what the name for the cocoon, but is wondering uh, would the cold have killed them? They won't be so bad, okay. or should he spray with BT or what? What here, Jonathan? BT is still a good idea in the spring. Uh, we would be looking probably at a late May, maybe early June application for that BT. It depends just on the next few weeks, the degree days that are going to happen. It's just called a bag. Uh, it's not a cocoon in this case. It's what they've constructed to protect themselves. And it usually helps with the winter, but some of them will have been frozen. If a bagworm egg, which is in the bag, is exposed to negative 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 straight hours, then they will freeze to death. But if they get above that at any point, they'll kind of come through that so they can survive a lot of cold, but not all the cold. So some of them will die. We saw this happen back in 2011 or 2014. I can't remember which, but it should happen again. All right, excellent. Good news for bagworm yeah, world. The one, few, one of the few pests <laughs> that'll die from the cold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, Bill. Uh, this is a snow mold from any who or anywhere in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So it's a rotten a spot, but it's actually recovery time, right? Yep, yep. Uh, it's something that we um, start to see this time of year when you have uh, snow, snow cover. And it's something that we generally don't recommend treating for because for the most part, it's superficial. Uh, and so in here, if you look down at the top of this, you can see the damage from, this is a, a pink snow mold, um, but you'll see there's green grass growing up there. And so if the grass is, is dead because of snow mold or the leaves are dead because it's the winter time and they, we didn't get snow on the particular year, either way in Nebraska, the grass pretty much has to regrow from the crowns anyways. And so um, it's just gonna be patient. You know, I've done, actually done some research studies as an undergrad about should you rake it, should you mow it differently? And it turned out that they all greened up at the same time. So as long as it's not dead, which it shouldn't be based on pink snow molds, you know, not really that lethal, just give it some time. And once you start uh, mowing, you know, just you're gonna mow it off and mulch it into the lawn and it's gonna be fine. So nothing really you need to do, uh, but it just can look a little unsightly. All right. Thank you so much. Fungus Among Us on this one. This is also Auburn, uh, and it is also on a red oak twig. Okay. Happened last year as well, and they're kind of wigged out again, because here comes this on this twig. I was actually cleaning up some branches in my yard the other day and saw that exact jelly fungus. Um, so that is a, it's a jelly fungus. Um, most likely it's a, a tree ear. Tree ear mushroom is a, is a type of jelly fungus, but a lot of those kind of softer, softer fungi are, are, are classified as a jelly fungus. But yeah, these, these tree ear fungi are, they're, they're pretty cool. Um, I, during, during the season, they'll get kind of a nice red color um, and be really fleshy. If you want to, you can eat them. Um, you wanna make sure that you do know what they are, but they can be eaten. Um, if, you, if you're a fan of hot and sour soup, the Chinese restaurants, there's a good chance that they have some of the tree ear mushrooms um, inside of it. And also then, uh, there's another, a related species of tree ear uh, mushroom that is actually used medicinally as well. But, but yeah, I would just enjoy the, enjoy the cool gelatinous kind of growth coming off of the, coming off of the tree. It's not going to kill the tree. Um, it means that that branch was probably already dead. And so it is colonizing the already rotten, rot, rotted wood, but it's not causing more damage. All right. Excellent. Although it, I, I 
really like hot and sour soup. <laughs> Maybe I'll look for those. But, but you, you, don't want, you don't want to be eating those? <laughs> I don't know. I like shrooms, but I don't know about those. <laughs> All right, Sarah, speaking of Eumonymous, this is an Elkhorn viewer who says, should he trim the branches off where the rabbits have chewed? And I think our viewers can see one side was apparently the favorite feast. Right. So... Um, one of the great things about Euonymus is that it can really tolerate pretty heavy pruning. So, yes, you know, going back to what I said earlier, depending on how much bark damage there is on the branches, um, those with more than 50% of the bark that's been removed, you probably want to take those off. But the others you can go ahead and leave and give them a chance. But even if you have to prune out a lot of stems, um, burning bush can grow back from that. So just give it a, give it a few years, and uh, it will generate new stems, and it'll grow back. All right, excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Well, one of our favorite parts of the show is to bring you those weekly updates from the Backyard Farmer Garden here on campus. There's not much going on out there yet, but there's plenty to talk about. Let's take a minute to visit the Backyard Farmer Garden. We're beginning our season in the Backyard Farmer Garden as we always do, showing you what's going on in this beautiful space. Of course, we have our hearts and minds with people who have been impacted by the flooding, and what we hope to be able to bring you is a little bit of joy and sunshine through the growing season. Our soil, of course, has not been impacted by flooding, by sand, by silt, by any of that debris, so we will show you exactly what you perhaps can do in your own spaces if you do have those issues. We also want to make sure that you understand during the show what you can and cannot consume or eat or use out of your own gardens if you do get them planted. And there are many of you, of course, who were not impacted by the flooding. That said, we always have beautiful plants in our garden. We give you great IPM recommendations. We try to do things right. And we also try to tell you what goes wrong in our own backyard farmer garden. I think the past few years in our garden have really been beautiful and of course we have big plans for another great season. Lots of stuff going on in, in the greenhouse and ready to get out there and rock and roll. Okay, questions. Let's see. Let's pick off <laughs> a Japanese beetle question. What time of year is it? I have to do this one already. <laughs> well, we had a lot of them coming in actually. And All of right. course it is people who, the first one really is, is there an organic way to control them? Okay, the adults, there are some options, neem oil, spinosad, um, there's pyrethrins and pyola oils and things like that. Uh, the larva, the grub form, you can do some biocontrol with nematodes. It's really just gonna be a matter of how much you're willing to spend. Nematodes can be a more expensive option, talking like maybe over $100 an acre compared to what would be an insecticidal application of 20 or $30 per acre. So if you're willing to pay that, that is an option for the grub control, but you'll have to look around and see where you can buy those or if you've got any companies near you. How effective are those? The nematodes, they can be really effective actually. Uh, there's some cool research that's been done at Rutgers and a few other places and a really famous story of them using them at Stonehenge and seeing the grubs get destroyed at Stonehenge with the nematode use. So it, it does work if you do it right. It has to be sort of a curative, you gotta water them in, it can't be over 90 degrees, follow the labels and you'll, you'll see something. The aliens told them? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The druids, the druids yeah, yeah. came up with it. <laughs> Whatever works, I don't care where it came from. <laughs> okay, uh, Bill, this is a Norfolk viewer who, who wants to know how to get sand, a sand layer removed to restore their turf in flooded areas. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of this. It depends on how much sand is there, and it can be from the flood, or it can be from all the sand that we're seeing being spread for snow melt. I mean, it's been the thing to try to get away from salts from an environmental perspective, but we're pushing all this sand and we're burying our turf. Um, if you have feet of, of sand, it's really gonna be getting out there with equipment and actually trying to move it, working with your um, local uh, 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 that resource district to figure out what to do with that sand. Um, you can't mm -hmm. just you know just get rid of it or throw it out. Um, and so we do have some resources on our website on the flood that you know at edu and on the turf website. Um, if it's just a thin layer um, that you can try to rake it up and try to get that that foliage through that sand so it can get you know get up and exposed. Um, and hopefully too there's some energy stored in those crowns that you know, can can make it up uh, all the way through that sand. But um, it really depends on how severe the 
that cover is. It, and I assume that sooner is better if at all possible. Yeah, and if you have to seed, it's the time to seed would be again now. Um, and you can seed into that sand, um, a little bit of that sand too. It's, you know, golf courses do that all the time. So it's not, a, it's not an uncommon thing. Okay, all right. So Kyle, mm -hmm. morel season. And the question of course is, those morels love living along the river. Yes, they do. And should people who are the great morel hunters eat the ones that they find in flooded areas? No, oh, now's the time to cue that sad Charlie Brown music. <laughs> um, <laughs> unfortunately, <clears throat> probably not gonna be a good year to do much, much morel hunting. Um, the floodwaters, they spread a lot of junk. Um, a lot of contaminants, there are chemical contaminants. Um, and one of the things about morels is they're, they're so porous and they can absorb really anything. And it's gonna be really difficult to, to know that that morel that you picked along the, along the Platte River hasn't been absorbing all of the, all the water, all the, the nasty water, and they're, um, with just all the folds on, the, on morels. They're so difficult to clean. Uh, so really, I would advise probably don't do much morel hunting this year. All right. As, as sad as that is to say. All right, thanks, Kyle. And Sarah, on the same note, this is a North Bend viewer who wonders about safety of eating asparagus that came up through flooded waters. Right, so the general guideline to follow with um, vegetable crops and fruits for that matter is that if the edible portion of the plant is in contact with the soil, then you want to have at least 120 days from, uh, from the flood, when the flood ends, until harvest. Um, if the edible portion is not in contact with the soil, then the guideline is 90 days. Now, um, so for example, if you wanted to plant spinach, early spinach in a vegetable garden, since it's a leaf crop and it's in contact with the soil and it's a, a fairly fast crop, uh, that, that wouldn't be a good idea because there would be so much potential for contaminants to come from the soil and be on the spinach when you're eating it. Um, so keep that in mind. If the edible portion is in contact with the soil, it's 120 days. If it's not in contact with the soil, it's 90 days. So if you're growing tomatoes that are going to be up off the ground and it's going to be later in the summer when those are ready to harvest, then you probably would be okay. Now the other thing to keep in mind too is, is that product going to be eaten raw? So, for example, potatoes, if you want to grow potatoes, which are obviously grown right in the soil, but potatoes are almost never eaten raw. There's a kill step that would help to kill off um, salmonella and E. coli and various other foodborne pathogens. So that's another thing to keep in mind, too. All right. Sarah, you going to win this one? You have a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so... <clears throat> If tomatoes and other plants were started inside and grew too fast, can he slow them down in a 55 degree garage with lights? Yeah, slow, uh, colder temperatures will help slow them down, but do make sure they have good light. I wouldn't go below um, 55, that's probably a base temperature. All right, uh, this is a person in Alliance who has a 15 foot tall bur oak, no acorns, and, and this is a viewer who actually wants them because he wants to feed the squirrels. I think it's just age. I mean, it can take um, oaks a long time to start producing. Sometimes, you know, we don't see acorns until the tree is 20 or 30 feet tall. All right. Uh, when is our, <clears throat> excuse me, our last frost date in Nebraska? Depends on what part of Nebraska you're in. Here in the eastern part of Nebraska, it's usually around um, about April 30th. In western Nebraska, it's, it's about May 21st. All right. This is a viewer who wants to get a, a geranium that they overwintered to bloom in the winter. It did last year, but what do they do to make it do it again? So that could depend a little bit on how you started the plant. If it was um, a big plant that you brought in the house and just cut back, or if you took stem cuttings and you rooted them, the stem cuttings would take a lot longer to bloom. But then light's also a factor. You need to have really high light for blooming in the winter. Excellent. Nice job. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> Golf clap, yes. <laughs> okay, you're ready. Oh, of course. <laughs> we had a viewer uh, last year, many of them, who had terrible problems with powdery mildew on nine bark, and this was in Kearney. So what to do this year or expect? Um, typically, I mean, I don't recommend a whole lot of, con of control with powdery mildew aside from pruning to increase airflow. So try to, if, you, if there are big trees in the area, try to get rid of some of those big branches. But increase airflow if you need to. You can spray some sort of copper-based solution, though. All right, uh, 
pear rust last year, will it attack anything else or is it just our pears? The, as far as I, well, there are a few different types of pear rust, but it should only, only attack the pears. All right. Uh, are there soil-borne pathogens that will withstand the flooding that we should be concerned with? Oh, there are soil-borne pathogens that have loved the flooding, so yes. All right. This is a Lexington viewer who had onions that rotted last year in the soil. Will they do the same thing in the soil again this year? Um, there's a good chance they will if it was, a, if it was caused by a, by a pathogen, especially with this excess moisture, that pathogen is going to be very active this season as well. So yeah. rotate, rotate, rotate. Rotate, rotate. Okay, nice. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> we encourage each other. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Great British like Bake Off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill, you ready? Let's do it. What is the seeding window for fescue? Uh, we want to get it down as soon as we possibly can in the spring before it gets really hot, so now. Okay, do we recommend a blend for lawns or a like a blend of different turf types? Yeah, a lot of times we'll see um, some different grasses in there, especially a tall fescue, it might be like 90% tall fescue and a little bit of bluegrass to help fill in if you get an opening, so that's pretty typical. All right, uh, this is a Gothenburg viewer who wonders whether buffalo grass needs fertilizer in the spring. Nope, buffalo grass is a warm season grass, so you wanna fertilize it when it's actively growing. That's for all the grasses, honestly, so that's why we don't like these early spring and late fall apps and even cool season lawns, but I wait till that grass is growing, and I see a lot of benefit, honestly, from August apps for my buffalo grass around here, so. Excellent, stay mm -hmm. tuned, viewers. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, is fine fescue okay in a shady condition without water? I, this is Northwest Iowa. I wouldn't do it. Maybe it's cool enough there, but we have a really hard time keeping it alive. Tall fescue is actually equally or more shade tolerant. Try that one. All right, nice job. Four, four, four. <laughs> We're going for the tie today. Uh, oh, I got a tie? So I don't want to do the hot I'll, I'll talk real slow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Jonathan, this is a Donovan, Donovan viewer who wants to know when to treat for borers in lilac and with what? Okay, with any of those borers, you can put out a pheromone trap that'll tell you when they're flying, but really late April, you could go out with a pyrethrin down the trunk to run off and you would be protecting that plant. All right, this viewer said they saw tiny little pollinators in their crocus like just this week. Mm -hmm. What might those have been? Could be some of our early pollinating flies, those hoverflies. Could also be some of those solitary native bees starting to get going for the season. Excellent. So this is a York viewer who said, seemed like a huge number of very little worms, mm -hmm. not grubs, under rocks. What, they, good guys? They love being under the rocks. It's hard to tell without seeing one, but yeah, most of the worms are gonna be beneficial, but we are dealing with some invasive ones, so you might wanna check that out. Okay. Is there a pre-aphid control for milkweed? And this is a Sutton viewer. Just being observant, going out there and making sure that they're not popping up. Blow them off with water if you see them. All right, rose canes last year had a borer and they cut those canes out. Are they still gonna be an issue? You could seal those up. That'll cause less attraction and treat for aphids. That'll make those wasps less interested in the plant. All right, and by the way, viewers, Elmer's glue is the sealant <laughs> on rose canes, which is if you're not gonna eat it. <laughs> Sarah. I know people that eat glue. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Plants of the week, Sarah. Yeah, some great early flowers here. So. A beautiful daffodil here in the front, and of course, that's a great sign of spring when you when you finally see the daffodils blooming. Um, really helps us out when we're tired of all this winter. Then, of course, we've got some um, pretty yellow forsythia here, and forsythia is a, a, another great early spring flower. If you're having trouble with your forsythia uh, not blooming as well as you expect, remember not to prune them in the fall because the flower buds are set in the fall, and if you prune them during the dormant season, then you're likely to cut off a lot of those flower buds, and you'll end up losing the prettiest, the prettiest feature of forsythia, which is these beautiful flowers, okay? Then, but then we've got um, a little one here. Now this one is called white forsythia, but it's not actually a true forsythia. Um, it's the uh, genus is Abeliophyllum, and um, it's not native in North America. It comes from China and Asia, uh, but it's a, a nice little shrub, about three to five feet tall and, and about the same width. Uh, with these beautiful little white flowers, and it does have a nice fragrance to it too. So um, white forsythia is the common name of this one. Excellent, and a little breath of sunshine. Definitely, nice to see. All right, All right. pictures. Okay, Jonathan, uh, this is a Unadilla villa who was 
viller <laughs> viewer who was pruning their peaches and found these funky twigs with okay. these like little little lines of something on there. Very funky, yeah. So I was talking with my coworkers John Porter and Scott Evans about this one and they agreed that this is cicada damage that is on this plant. Cicadas, one of my favorite insects. They've got really cool googly eyes. They've got a needle for a mouth and then the females have a big sword on their butt that they use to lay their eggs basically. They cut into plants, they cut through the thin bark, they insert their eggs there, the eggs hatch, the nymphs fall down to the soil and burrow in, and then they're gonna start feeding in that root zone on the sap. There's not a whole lot that we can do about this, and cicadas are cool, so we really shouldn't treat for them anyway. If the damage is getting outrageous and you've got a lot of annual cicadas, you can net the plant. You can put kind of a bird netting over it and the cicadas can't really get through that anymore. But other than that, I wouldn't worry too much about that. It's just kind of a, an oddity that happens with that particular insect. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Okay, speaking of sand, this yep. next picture actually is sand and de-icer on turf in a non-flooded area. So what what to do here? I mean, it's there's yeah. maybe there's turf under there, I don't know. I don't know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, if you can try to remove this sand as best you can, um, try to do that. Um, if you can try to rake up whatever foliage is underneath and bring it to the surface, then that can be a benefit. Um, if it's really deep or um, if the lawn was kind of thin, a lot of times it's really, really obvious, that might be a good time to you know, get some seed or something down uh, in that location. Um, wouldn't worry too much about the salt. We've had a lot of precipitation and so the salts move through our soils. So you don't need to do anything uh, for the salt. The salt's only an issue if you're irrigating with, with salty water. Um, and a lot of people have kind of gone away too from sodium-based salts too. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to put calcium down because calcium is also a salt. So you're making a salt issue worse by putting more salt down. So just let the natural spring rains take care of any potential salt issues you might be dealing with. All right, thanks Bill. All right, Kyle, this is a, a Grand Island viewer that has a crab apple that has this thing on the trunk and cause and solution. Yeah, well, the, um, new tree. it's the, it looks to me like uh, just some, some, some uh, kind of a collar rot that's going on. The, the discoloration down at the base and a pretty definite line between the, um, the, the sick bark and the healthy or the healthy portion of the tree and the unhealthy portion of the tree is fairly typical of Phytophthora uh, collar rot, which can be fairly devastating on, on apples. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of good controls once you have this much damage. Um, I was talking about pathogens that love the, love the flooding that we've had. Phytophthora is one of those that loves the moisture. And so anything that you can do to dry that, to dry that site out would be the best. Um, make sure that you are removing some of the mulch away from the base of the tree to help that dry out. If there are some severely um, infected areas, one thing that you can try is to very gently go and remove some of that bark and then let that, um, let that lower portion of the tree just dry out over the entire course of the season. Don't cover it, but just let it dry out and hopefully that will decrease the amount of fungi that's, that's in there. All right, thanks Kyle. Sarah, this is uh, erosion damage in Council Bluffs. The picture is from last year as people can see because we have plants, but now it's worse. So how do you stop these ditch things in, in, a, in a garden or in a landscape? So if this is an area where, you, where you, you have regular trouble with this, and it sounds like two years in a row they've had problems with this in the landscape. So what you might wanna do is think about creating something um, similar to what we call like a dry stream bed. And so the idea there is that you, you're gonna line this with rocks and the rocks are a little bit better at, at slowing the water down and making it move, move more slowly through that area of the landscape. So what you would do with this is regrade it so that it's, it's at the grade that you want it to be. Then where you're gonna put the drainage area or the dry stream bed, you're gonna put some landscape fabric down and then you'll put a landscape rock, like maybe river, river rock or something along that line to fill the bed probably about um, I'd say a couple of inches deep and just um, create this nice little pathway for the water to follow through the rock instead of through your mulched bed. And so the goal of that would be that the water would stay in the rock and then you, you wouldn't see this, um, this really severe erosion happening in this bed, you know, in the future. All right, thanks, Sarah. 
You know, there are so many topics we'd like to get to early in the season, and we have this little tiny window in which to do so. We've got some great apple tree care trips, tips from Vaughn Hammond from Kimmel Orchard during our winter show. Right now, he returns to talk to us about pruning. We promised that we would talk to you about how to prune apple trees when the time was right. And here we are talking about apple trees. This is Vaughn Hammond. Vaughn is our expert at pruning pretty much everything fruit-wise. So Vaughn, the million dollar question is when do we prune our apple trees? And that is a great question. There's really three times that you prune an apple tree. The first time you prune an apple tree is a planting. You're pruning the roots and pruning for that initial structure. The next time that you might think about pruning an apple tree or any fruit tree is during the summer. It's called summertime pruning. And really that's just simply a repair or a, a real maintenance type of pruning. So if you've had some storm damage or something along those lines, it's to, to, to correct those problems. You don't want to remove too much foliage during that time of year. And then of course your primary pruning period is during dormancy, that late November through April time period. Second, of course, is why are we doing this pruning? Give us a lot of information about that if you can. So really the dormant pruning is important in that this is the time of year that we can really see the structure of the tree. The leaves are off the tree and you can see what that branch structure has to offer. What we're looking at doing is really opening up that tree for a couple of reasons. Of course, primarily for sunlight penetration because it's that sunlight that converts the carbohydrates to the sugars that we like as consumers, as people eating fruit. The other reason is to open it up so the tree dries earlier for insect and disease control because allowing the tree to dry earlier in the day or more quickly allows, removes one of the components of how a disease manifests. It allows that tree to actually dry much, much quicker. And finally, how do we do this? Do we grab a chainsaw? Do we grab loppers? What do we do to prune the apple trees? Okay, so there's a few rules that you really need to follow. And if you follow those rules, you, you can't go wrong. Number one, downward, downward growing growth is very unproductive. So anything that's growing downward, crossing branches and rubbing branches, anything like that that can cause damage to the primary structure of the tree you remove. Water suckers, of course, which can happen anywhere on the tree, but really now that everything's grafted, there tends to be a lot of water sprouts from the graft union. There tends to be water sprouts on the, the scaffold branches and trunks, so all those come out. Uh, anything that's really shading another branch needs to come out anything that's broken or a stub of any sort, those stubs and broken branches are actually access points for disease and insect. The other thing is depending on the pruning style that you're looking at or, or structure style that you're looking at, you want to prune to a single leader. You don't want to have multiple leaders except in the conditions of pears. That's a little bit different situation, but for apples you want a single leader so it's not a competing leader and then you want to remove any narrow crotches that there might be because a narrow crotch tends to be a weak crotch and you get a heavy fruit load and it will tend to rip away and damage the tree. Thanks Vaughn. I know people who have been so anxious for spring and to get through the flooding and haven't gotten their apple trees pruned are probably really anxious to hit that little tiny window in which they can still do their major pruning. Yep, just remember there's still a little bit of time. Practicing those tips for pruning your apple trees will really help you have a successful harvest each year, and it's a lot of work. But Vaughn has done a number of interviews about fruit trees for us over the years. You can find those on our YouTube channel, Backyard Farmer. I have so, a lot of beard in beef with Vaughn. A <laughs> beard in. Well, you can do a bee, be I could bee try beard it. for us. I could do a bee beard in. No, not, yeah, not in here. <laughs> okay. Jonathan, uh, your last picture is from somebody who's a praying mantis egg case. Okay and says, they was, has the winter been too hard this year because we really haven't seen as many as last year? Okay, no, I think that they'll still hatch out this year. There might be some kill off from those, but again, with insects, you have to have the lethal temperature and then the lethal amount of time. And if that temperature gets above that lethal temperature at any point during that cold period, then they're gonna survive. They have a lot of antifreezes in their blood. There's a lot of protective foam there with this Utheca 
that we see with this mantis. So I would guess that there's 300 happy, wiggly, little nymphal mantids in there just waiting to come out and eat each other till the champion <laughs> survives. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, Bill, uh, your last picture here is one that is a weed that is scattered throughout the asparagus bed, but also through the garden and in the turf. Mm -hmm. um, does try to limit the use of herbicides. Yep. This is a uh, common chickweed. Um, you can differentiate it from its uh, brother, uh, mouse-eared chickweed, because it doesn't have hair on the leaves. Um, it is a winter annual, so it germinated um, like the weeds that uh, Sarah talked about at the beginning of the show uh, last fall. And uh, it's going to complete its life cycle, and we're going to see these uh, white flowers, and then it's going to die in the uh, uh, when the heat comes in. So not a lot we need to do. Generally shallow rooted, so the best thing you probably do is just pull it out. Um, and I wouldn't recommend really having to, to spray for it. And if you really, really don't want to see it next year, um, and it's not a vegetable area, you, you can do a pre-emergence application in the fall because it's a, a winter annual. All right, thank you, Bill. Okay, Kyle, this is all the way from uh, Lincoln to South Sioux City, and the question is, what is this and its friend and its next friend? So we have three different pictures of this beast, I think. All right, well, that uh, first one is a, it's a gall of cedar apple rust. Um, very common, it's one of our gymnosporangium rusts, which means that it, Really, it alternates between having a juniper host and a rosaceae host. So this one alternates between, between cedar trees and apples, or the, those in the malice. And here I actually have, have a gall that Kim had so kindly picked for me earlier today. Um, but as the, as the spring kind of warms up, we have more moisture. This gall will start to, oops, there we go. This gall will start to put out a bunch of these yellow, uh, these orange tendrils that are full of, and those are the fungal spores. Those spores will then uh, be blown via wind onto the apple trees and then cause the, the symptoms on, on the apple, that cause that apple rust. Um, as, when you see these galls on your, on your junipers or on your cedar trees, typically not a whole lot of concern. Um, they, they, don't, they don't really harm the cedar trees. However, they can be fairly damaging on apples, especially if you have repeated, um, repeated infections year after year. And so if you are wanting to protect your apples from cedar apple rust, you'd want to be looking at um, to spray kind of that um, early pink stage to petal drop um, of the, uh, of, of the flower, apple flowers. So when it's on the twig and it's bright orange, is that the same thing? Or that's a, that's a different one of our gymnosporangium rusts, and so those um, there are a few. There, some go between hawthorn and cedar. Some go between kints and cedar. Um, really, there's there's a bunch of them, but they all kind of have that that unique orange spore mass that you'll see um, kind of late spring. All right, thank you, Kyle. All right, Sarah, um, this is a person who has a sugar maple, and apparently it's pretty close to four feet from the trunk to the driveway, and, and you can't really see the driveway in this picture. But the question is, will the roots continue to grow above ground its entire life? It's a 40-year-old tree. Yes, they will. Um, <laughs> Lightning round. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, they they won't uh, go deeper or burrow deeper in the ground. Um, so yeah, they're always going to be there. Um, if I guess what I would suggest, if this were my landscape, is I would just create a, a landscaping bed underneath that tree. I would I would mulch that whole area, eliminate the turf, uh, eliminate that headache of trying to mow under there or trying to maintain grass in what is probably a shaded area. Um, and then if you want to, you could put some perennials or something in there wherever you can fit them in, in and amongst the tree roots. But yes, the roots are always going to be there. All right, and no turf over those roots. Right. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Even you wouldn't do that, right? No, I took, I took it out of my yard. I don't want to mow those roots. I know. All right, uh, Jonathan, we actually had two additional Japanese beetle quests. All right. <laughs> <laughs> one, one is a, a linden that was stripped, oh. wanting to control the infestation, and another is white birch and roses. This one used traps. Okay. So... Traps, I'm going to have to say that all the university research really says that we shouldn't be using those in our smaller landscapes. If you've got a big acreage and you can put that trap far away from the plant that you want to protect, that's a slightly different story. 
But if it's anywhere within like 90 feet of the plant, it actually increases the rates of defoliation on the plant that you want to protect. And unfortunately, when I see people use traps, I often see them tied to the birch tree or to the rose plant that they want to protect. So if you can put it far away or if you can adapt the trap by taking off the bag and attaching like a 55 gallon drum or hooking it over a fish pond or over a chicken area, I've heard all these different solutions where then the beetles will fall through and feed things then the trap can be viable, but it's just such a potent lure in there that it's a really tough thing to be successful with. As for the linden tree, there's not a lot that you can do on your own. If you wanna hire a certified arborist, you can look through the Nebraska Arborist Association or the International Society's uh, webpage to find local arborists that are certified. Then you can get somebody that may come out and do a soil treatment or an injection on your plant, or they may be willing to treat the upper portion of the plant but you cannot do anything on your own. The labels all say that we shouldn't be treating on our own with the linden tree. Excellent, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Bill, this is a viewer that had sod put down last year and it's in Bennington, newly constructed. There's some gaps. Wonders whether he should oversee this spring and forego a pre-merge or wait. Yeah, that's generally, um, if you're sodding, um, it's probably a tall fescue saw there. So what you'd want to do actually is just get some topsoil or even just some loose dry soil and try to fill those cracks in um, just for mowing uh, issues. I know I see this in my neighborhood a lot too and so that's something you can do. And then a lot of times you can reach out to the sod grower and you can buy seed from them. So uh, you can get the seed that matches the others so you don't have like some really yellow little strips that you interseeded. Um, next to our dark green sod. And so I would do those two things this spring um, just to kind of help. And like you said, if you're gonna seed, don't put the pre-emergence down um, because they will generally have a problem with the seed things, so. All right, thanks, Bill. Kyle, we mentioned pear rust mm -hmm. in the lightning round and last year we had a lot of people with it. So mm -hmm. when do they treat for it if they're going to treat for it? Uh, time to treat for it would be about when, um, kind of wanna be looking for when those pears are starting to flower. And so that's gonna be, so late May thereabouts um, is when we'd wanna start, wanna start thinking about that. All right, and hopefully we won't have quite as much this year. Oh, uh, hopefully. Maybe. <laughs> All right, Sarah, this is a Waterville, Kansas viewer, so shout out to Kansas. Um, she has, or he has a mini crepe myrtle. We have a couple on campus, they're called Philly, usually. How far should they be cut back and when? Well, you know, unfortunately, crepe myrtle is not very hardy in Nebraska. We're, we're really on the northern edge of the hardiness for that. So what I would look for is to see if you have any branches that have winter killed. Um, and you should be able to see that now. You, you might be able to see buds swelling, but you can certainly tell the difference between the color of the bark. You know, the, the living bark will be have a greenish tinge to it, whereas the, any bark that's winter killed may be a darker brown or maybe even a black color. So you would wanna make your cuts back to where you have good living wood on the branches. Um, but it is still, we do still have the potential for cold, you know, or freezing temperatures up until, you know, probably the first week in May. So since this is a really sensitive plant, I probably would wait to do that pruning until we get past any potential chances of freezes because if you prune it early and we have a freeze, you could have more damage on the plant. So I would wait on that. All right, and, and for that viewer, send us a picture. I don't think we've ever had one from Waterville, Kansas. Mm -hmm. There we go.